Okay. So again, thanks for being here. Um, I know it's kind of weird, uh, but we're uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through a couple notes here, about ten minutes worth of notes, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, we will have a Google question. You'll have to answer it today. Um, I'm grading yesterday's and today's questions, so make sure you answer it. Uh, do the best you can. Um, today's section, as you can tell here, we're doing the uh, renters and bankers rule for home loans and uh, renting. Uh, so let's talk about some vocab words. I think it's important we get some of these vocab words done before we actually get started today because it's uh, one of those things like, if you don't understand the vocab I'm gonna be using, it'll be, be kind of pointless. So uh, let's go through a couple things here. So let's talk about a mortgage. Um, what do you guys know about the word mortgage? You've probably heard of it before. What do you know about it? What do you think? Anyone at home? Yeah. Your house. Say it again? Your house. Yes. It is a loan for your home. For a home. So if you're going to take out a loan for a house from a bank, it is called a mortgage. It's very specific. The reason why they don't just call it you know, a loan, a home loan, um, it has a very specific formula that's calculated because usually houses cost a lot of money. So there is a specific formula on how they, how they uh, do it. It's called a compound interest loan. So compound interest. Um, basically meaning that they're going to get a lot of money out of you for taking out a loan. It's the same formula that they use for student loans, credit cards. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty scary number when you start to see it. Um, so mortgage is the loan you take out for a home. Now, the loan that you're actually getting is, is uh, you're financing that loan. Um, I know some people really have a problem with financing. Like there's some families that um, they're very strict on their children that say you should never finance anything, never take out a loan for anything you wanna save up. That's smart, it's really smart saying that because um, if you take out loans for things you are paying extra money back and that's called interest, right? Uh, interest is that extra payment you're making it's the extra pay um, or the extra cash that's involved for taking out a loan. You're paying you're paying the bank um, basically a little bit of extra money saying, hey, I need this today. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit of extra cash. It helps pay the bank's bills and stuff. Um, but yeah, but the money you're actually borrowing, that's called the principal. This is the actual cash borrowed. Um, that's the cash for the actual... Uh, for the actual mortgage itself. So maybe uh, the loan you're looking at for a home is an $80,000 loan, that's your principal. Uh, that is not including the interest, the interest is what you pay back over the long term of your loan. The principal is the amount that you're borrowing. Um, most banks will not let you borrow the entirety of the loan. What I mean by that is like, let's say you're buying an $80,000 home, you've negotiated it with your realtor or your neighbor or whoever you're doing it, maybe you're doing a private sale. The, the bank will not give you the loan for the entire home they will expect that you have to put a pretty substantial down payment. Um, now what a down payment is, I'm using a lot of terms, sorry. A down payment is that first payment. You have to put a pretty large down payment on a home. Uh, they expect it. Um, it could be anywhere from, from 10 to 20% of the home loan. So uh, when I bought my home here in Garner, uh, when I first moved to Garner, I, now I moved back to Ventura, uh, but the first payment I made in my home was 20% of my home. It was right off the top, cash. Had to pay it right off the top. I had to write a check. Um, you know, we bought the home we bought here in Garner was about, you know, it was about a $90,000 home. And I, I wrote a $20,000 check right the first day I moved into my house to, to make sure we could get the down payment for the loan. So it was a pretty expensive. Um, in fact, I'll calculate that right now, a $90,000 mortgage my first payment had to be $18,000. I think I wrote it, it was like 16,600. I had some cash in my checking account. So I had to, I used all my savings at that point. It was gone, <laughs> all my savings from high school and on. It was gone in one foul swoop. Um, eventually you get that money back when you sell your home. That's what they expect. Um, but, but it's it's like a, it's a goodwill gesture to the bank saying that, hey. I have the cash and I can I can make these payments. It's kind of a goodwill gesture and they'll, they really appreciate it. Now, the other reason why you wanna make a really large down payment, why I chose to do a 20% down payment was because it will significantly drop down the amount that you're paying for the home in the long run. It is a super smart idea to make as much payment as you can if, you know, within reason for you 
to make a large down payment because it will significantly save you money in the long run. And that's something we're going to look at in the later sections. We're going to look at the numbers involved. We'll do some serious number crunching um, here in the next week or two. And I'm, I'm talking like that loan that I, you know, that, that amount that I did a down payment on saved me tenfold on my, my home, on the amount I would have paid for that home. Um, you know, I, I saved a good hundred grand just making a twenty thousand dollar payment. So, and I'll explain that later. Um, why it's it's always smart to do that, and why your parents are correct that you should always save money instead of just taking out loans. So, um, we'll talk about that later. Now, the the big thing today is called the renter's rule and banker's rule. The renter's rule is if you're going to rent, which is a smart idea, you should rent for a while. Um, you should always do that right in the beginning. I know that some people don't like doing that. Some parents, you know, really say that you shouldn't rent. You're wasting money. I think it's a good idea to figure out what your needs are. Um, find the location you like to live in. Um, you know, the general town you want to live in. Rent for a while so you have no obligation to stay there long term. You're not heavily invested. If you don't like your neighbors, if you don't like the the town itself, you don't like you know the the culture of the town, the feel of it. Um, it's a smart idea to figure out what your needs are when you have your, you know, your little family, um, because, you know, renting you can get a sense for how many bedrooms do I need, how many bathrooms will I need, um, because maybe you find out that you can survive with in a two-bedroom home with one bathroom, maybe that you find out once you're living, you know, with your significant other or with roommates or whoever you're renting with, maybe you need two bathrooms minimum. So, or, and you need two bedrooms. Like you can get a sense for what you need by just living together for a year or two. That's what me and my wife did. We rented when we were first married, just to get a sense for what size of home will we need. You know what? What are the requirements? And then we, once we knew what we, what we're, what we we're looking for, we could go out and find the home that fit us. So, uh, it's just I think it's a smart idea. You're not overly committing to a place if it's too big, it's too small. And there's lots of hoops to jump through if you have to go, you know, sell your home and buy a new one. Um, so that's that's just it's a word of wisdom to you guys from my own personal experience. Now the landlord is the person that you are renting from. It is a person that owns that owns the home that you're going to rent from. So um, this is the owner of the land, the owner of the home. Uh, I, if I could spell owner correctly, my goodness, it is the is the owner of the property. Um, you know, my first experience with my with a landlord down in you know Ames when I lived down there when I was going to school and when I was you know living in a home down there when I was teaching down there. Um, my experience was really good. I never even saw my landlord. They always stayed out of our hair. They never you know showed up unannounced. They would just you know they you know they, we didn't have a problem because I always made my payments on time. And it was just a nice experience. If there's something wrong with the home, they 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 already took care of it. You know, if a light went out, they just fixed it. Um, that's what a landlord should do, right? They should stay out of your hair. They should, you know, fix things when they need fixing if it's not your own issue. Um, but the you know landlord I had in Clear Lake was rough to deal with. <laughs> would show up, would expect us to pay for everything, even though we didn't require you know a sidewalk to be put in or anything like that. It was it was kind of rough. That's why we moved out pretty quick. Um, it was just sometimes you get a good landlord, sometimes you don't. You got to get a feel in that um, interview process when you're talking to them. What you know, what they're what you, what you should expect from them. You know the you know those unannounced visits or anything because they they own the property so they want to check in on it. But it's one of those things like sometimes they overstep themselves and so they can um, you need to you know let them know of you know the legality of what they're doing sometimes. So. Um, now the lease is the actual agreement you're going to make. So when you're going to take out a, uh, when you're going to rent for the first time, the lease is the agreement. It's the contract that you fill out. Um, you know, in this area, the lease can be for one year, it could be two years, whatever you sign. Um, it's always smart to go a year. Um, don't go too long. Um, you know, in college towns, they do this really evil thing in college towns where you know, college, you know, the the semester starts in you know in September usually, the first week of September or the last week in August, somewhere in that time frame, that's when college starts. But mortgage, or leases I should say, so not mortgages, but leases on apartments down there start in May. They start in May. And then so you have to go find your apartments quick. If you know you're going down to Ames, go find them in May, sign your lease, and then it's up the next May. Um, now the reason why they do that is because they want payments through the summer. 
those those landlords would like to have you know that that property paid for during the summer and also they expect that when you're done in may like let's say you graduate you're moving out and so that's why they do it the evil part is like you may not live down there during the summer and you're paying for an apartment that's really expensive and so it's kind of an evil thing um it would be it would be it would be better if they would start in august and go to august or august to go to may but they don't they they want payments through the summer to make sure that they're not taking cash out of their own pockets they need to pay for the you know the land and the the taxes and whatnot so i can i can understand from both perspectives uh but yeah they it's kind of evil when you get when you move from you know from city to city they have different you know lease agreements and you know terms and longevity and how long you can live there and all that but now let's talk about the renters rule let's start let's talk about that first okay all right so renters rule this is the part that you probably will need for the uh for the google question of the day the renters rule is pretty straightforward it is the amount of money you should pay on rent it, it will tell you the amount paid for rent uh, maybe i should spell paid correctly Paid for rent. Um, there's this this it's this weird unwritten rule. It's not, it's not an exact science. The, the renter's rule. It just gives you an, um, a kind of a, an estimate of what you should pay for rent depending on your budget. Um, it's not an exact science. Um, I used it when I was first rent renting down in Ames to know like what I could afford, what would make sense, and it's just the science that was you know. Somebody's already done the math behind it. They they know how much you should pay for rent so that you're not overspending and that you're not going to break your own budget by you know you won't have money left for for groceries or for you know the 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 utilities that are in that rental of property because maybe you have to pay for gas or water or electricity or internet or whatever they're going to make you pay. Um, so you just need to be careful on that that you don't overspend because the rent could be too high and you can't afford it and you can't afford you know to pay for the gas in your car or the insurance or the student loan that you're paying if you're uh, if you're you know paying a student loan at the time okay so here's how it works whatever your whatever your annual salary is okay so annual salary that means what you get paid per year right annual is per year what you do is you divide that by 52 okay and what that is, this will give you what you make, what, it, what is your pay or your salary per week. It's your, it's your weekly allowance, right? It's the weekly pay or the cash you get in hand. That is, this is considered net pay. I'm gonna put that on here, net pay. Now, what I mean by that is that it's after taxes, after insurances, after everything's taken out. Um, it's one week's pay. Um, so maybe maybe you get paid you know every two weeks. So take that every two week check and divide by two. All right, that's biweekly, right? Divide that by two to know what you make per week, and that's what you should be paying in rent. Maybe your rent's really low. I mean, it could be. So maybe you need to really choose wisely where you want to live. Um, to give you an idea why I moved from Clear Lake because I lived in Clear Lake years ago, and I was renting there, and why I moved to Garner, I was renting Clear Lake. A pretty small little home. It was, you know, it was a one bedroom, one bath kind of a home for my, for me and my wife. We didn't need anything large. We we're trying to get a sense for what size we needed. The rent in Clear Lake was the same price as us buying a ninety thousand dollar home here in Garner. We paid the exact same amount, and we own the home. The rent was the same exact price. It made no sense. Clear Lake's rent is too high because they live on the lake. So they can charge really high rent prices, as opposed to just owning a home in a different town. So that's why we decided to move to Garner. It was smart. I lived, you know, I worked here in Garner, but just money-wise, it was smart because we own a home and I wasn't wasting money on rentals. Um, and that's why we decided to uh, to make that purchase. Um, we we found a home that fit our budget, fit our style, and you know, and it worked out. We saved a lot of money. Um, by doing that. Now, I, it was a financial commitment because as you could tell, I had to put a really large down payment on the home to make sure that I saved cash and got the exact payment I wanted. Um, but it made sense because I wasn't just wasting money on a rental that I would never get back. You don't get your money back on a rental. You, It's just, you know, you're just kind of getting rid of it. But on a, on a home purchase, on a mortgage, you will make your money back if you sell the home. You'll make all your money back, hopefully, if you kept the home in nice condition. So you're not losing money. It's kind of like 
living there for free, as long as you can sell it for the same price you bought it for, or hopefully more. Um, so that's something you need to think about. So one week's pay. So let's say, I'll just make up a number, let's say you make $30,000 a year. Let's say you make $30,000 a year. This is your annual salary. So what you do is you take that number and you divide by 52. There's 52 weeks in a year. This, that's why you're finding what the price is per week. So $30,000 divided by 52. This should be $576.92. This is roughly the rent you should be using. Like the total rent, no more than that. One month's rent. That's the rent. So that's a pretty nice home. $500, $600. You can get a really nice home in this area for that. Um, for that monthly payment. You could you could get a really nice home if you're purchasing a home for that price in this area, in this area we live in anyway. You could own a really nice home for that exact monthly payment. So, um, yeah, that's it's one of those things like, it, it's a lot of money, I know it is, um, but one week's pay is just gives you enough ballpark. Now that is not net pay. That was just, you know, giving you a ballpark divided by 52. Um, does that make sense though? Okay, that's called the renter's rule. One week's pay is what you should pay in rent. Now, the next thing we have to talk about. It's the last topic today. This is called the banker's rule. This is something that I dealt with for the first time. I didn't even know of this rule until I was looking to purchase that home in, in Garner, you know, back in 2010 and 11, uh, when I was looking for home loans. Um, the banker's rule is what they do is they look at how much money you make per year, okay? So it's your annual salary, okay? And they'll, they want to know it. Now, again, it's important on a mortgage that the bank knows how much you make per year and you're honest about it. At a car dealership, they don't need to know that. <laughs> so there's a big difference there. We talked about, you know, getting car loans and, and loans back in a couple of units ago. What was that, unit three or two for us? It was unit two. We did car loans and taking out... You know, purchasing a car for the first time. A dealership doesn't need to know what you make per year. There's no reason to know that. They should just know what your credit is, and then they go off of that. Uh, they don't need to know what you make, because what they're doing is, if they want to know what you make per year, they're trying to adjust the price on the car to make a bunch of money off of you. They don't need to know that. They should just know what your credit score is. That's the only thing that they need to know anyway. Um, but for a bank, they do need to know, because they need to know if you can actually pay the student loan pay the home loan back because a home loan is very different than a car loan right car loan you make it in you know less than six years you pay off the car hopefully it's within your budget you're not trying to buy you know you know a lamborghini on a you know a mcdonald's budget that type of thing so um but on a banker's rule they do need to know because they need to know if you're buying a home that's way too large for you so what you do is you take your annual salary and this is the rule that banks use they multiply by 2.5 2.5 and that's a number that they've come up with all the banks use this and that's the maximum amount of money they'll allow you to borrow for a home loan 2.5 so um, they will not loan you more than 2.5 times what your annual salary is to buy your home your first home um, you have to have you know some step some you know credit established in your name so you might want to take out a small loan before that and pay it back or something um, but as long as as long as you have an annual salary that's steady and consistent and you're not jumping from job to job to job, they'll look at 2.5 times what your annual salary is and that's what they'll loan you for the first time. So let's go to that example I just said earlier. Let's say your annual salary is $30,000. Let's say that's your first job right out of college, right? You multiply by 2.5 and this is the loan that the bank will provide you for a home. As long as you have a consistent job and it's and it's and it's a regular thing and it's not just a one year contract, they'll allow you to take out a loan for seventy five thousand dollars for a home, for a mortgage. That's a maximum. They will not go past that. If you try to apply for a loan that is past that, um, you'll have to put either number one, you have to put a lot of things down as collateral. Uh, what I mean by collateral, uh, you have to put a lot of things down as like. If you were to default on payments, they'll show up and take your things from you. <laughs> so like it could be maybe you own a car, maybe you own a, a boat, maybe you own some property that you you know that you put on there. Um, they'll look at the valuation of those and they'll add it in. So if you can't make your payments, they'll, they'll eventually repossess those objects from you as payments. Uh, so that's a scary thing. So, um, but you have to own those items. You can't 
put something on that list as collateral if you're still making payments on it because you don't own it yet. So that's something to think about. You can't have a loan on the object that you're putting as collateral. Um, so they'll deny you. I mean, they'll. That's where you get a lot of loans that will say deny. There was um. There's a couple apps that were out there um, for a while on your smartphones that you could instantly see whether you could get a home loan. Um, they had a bunch of commercials there for a while. They stopped doing them now um, because they're kind of fraudulent. Where they would, you know, they would give you you type in all your information into the app, and then what they would do is they would go search the major loan companies and say that yes, you're pre-approved for you know a two hundred thousand dollar home loan. What they were slowly doing was you know keeping track of your finances and stuff, and it's not smart to use those apps because they they slowly ruin your credit score because you're they're constantly checking your credit to see if you can still make your payments. Um, don't don't use those. Just go to a bank, a normal bank, and see if they'll allow you to have that type of loan. Uh, but this is the banker's rule. So 2.5 times whatever your annual salary is. If I don't provide you an annual salary, you have to find it. So that's something we're going to look at on Monday next week. Maybe I give you a monthly salary. Maybe I give you a weekly salary, and you have to go find what your annual is. So I'll have those charts back up. So, all right, Google question is live. You can go answer it. I believe it's a renter's rule problem. Um, I give you a certain salary that you're working with, and you have to tell me what your rent could be. So you have to find what your weekly salary is. So either divide by 52, or maybe I tell you what your two-week salary is, divide by two, that type of thing. Um, but there you go. Um, for everyone that's online, you guys can log off. Uh, thank you for being here. Happy Thanksgiving to you guys, and uh, I'll see you guys next week. So take care of yourself. So, all right. Bye, guys.